in order to defeat your enemy, you have to know your enemy well, right? So in this presentation, instead of just presenting to you a recipe book of how to treat this chronic disease of obesity, like a protocol from step one to the next, I would like to present to you the mechanistic view on, on the pathophysiology and the molecular basis of obesity. My objective today is to define obesity and its prevalence, explore the root cause of the disease in the most fundamental level, and explore the different factors that affect the pathology. There is extreme obesity in the United States, and currently, the data show that there's about 40%, and it's progressing at alarming rate. Even the pediatric population is now affected. In fact, we are now defending against a high weight set point compared to that in the 50s and 60s. And why is that? Gene mutation happens millions of years. Gene mutation doesn't happen in 50 years. So what's going on? This will be explored in this talk. This is an old slide in 2015. And let me turn my laser. And during this time, it shows that only 25% of the population are healthy, and the rest, 75%, are sick, insulin resistant. Some of them are diabetic, some are pre-diabetic, some are overweight, obese, and non-diabetic, and no symptoms. Also, of them are carbohydrate intolerant. I remember the time, I remember that time when my father visited me in New York City, um, I was doing my residency during that time, and it was his first time to visit me from the Philippines. And while we were in Manhattan at Macy's shopping, he quietly whispered to my ear, and he asked me, why are there so many people with obesity here? And I, I told him, Dad, this is the U.S., don't be surprised. And that was in 1998. Look at where we are now. You could see the, you could see the progress of different deeper colors that's showing in the map. The deeper the colors, the more prevalent obesity is. And the United, southern United States is the most prevalent. It's 35 to 40% now. Well, you can see this in photos. 1950s to 2015. 1950s to 2015. If you were obese in, 2000, in, 19, in uh, 1950, you will stand out like a sore thumb, but not anymore. A 2018 publication showed that only 12% of the American population are healthy. And the rest, 88%, are metabolically sick. That is, they have metabolic syndromes despite having no symptoms. Our population's metabolic health is alarmingly low, even in normal weight individuals. To make it worse, in 2022, from the American College of Cardiology, it showed that only 6.8% only uh, are healthy. It went down from 12%, and 93% are cardiometabolically not healthy, and a lot of them have no symptoms. This is crazy. So there are two prevailing theories in obesity. First is the calorie balance theory, which states that calorie in equals calorie out. This means that if you eat more calories and burn less, you will gain weight. And the other way around is true. If you burn more and you eat less, you will lose weight. So this is the first law of thermodynamics. We learned this in our physics class. However, our body is not a closed system. We are an open system because we are influenced by our own hormones. And hence the second theory, the insulin carbohydrate related theory. It states that the hormonal imbalances related to insulin resistance can lead to the development of obesity. So the more carbohydrates you eat, the more you stimulate the production of insulin. And you know that insulin inhibits lipolysis and promotes lipogenesis. So in this case, you are going to store more fat. And the more fat you store, the more hypertrophy your fat cells are, and you end up with obesity. So there are actually two schools of thoughts, right? So let's not be divisive. Consensus is better. There is a strong, strong proof, that sh which I will show to you in subsequent slides, that both sides have a role, that the calorie camp and the insulin camp have, has a role in the disease of obesity. 
in the food and energy metabolism. They are actually bipartisan. So, are we fat because we overeat? Or do we overeat because we're fat? It is indeed a timeless question. I submit to you that the problem of obesity comes from a dysfunctional, problematic mitochondria. You will see here the different chronic diseases of the periphery, diabetes type 2, insulin resistance, hypertension, dementia, atherosclerosis, the like. These are the diseases that we encounter, the modern diseases of civilization. We tend to treat these peripheral diseases, but you will not be successful unless you treat the root cause, a dysfunctional white adipose tissue. This is the mantra in obesity medicine. You have to treat the obesity together with the chronic disease, or if there is still no chronic morbidity, you have to treat the obesity already. And I submit to you that the problem of dysfunctional white adipose tissue is from a dysfunctional mitochondria. On top of that, there is central control from our peripheral tissues, including adipose tissues, to the brain. If the adipose tissue is full of energy, so it is already loaded and overloaded, it will produce leptin, which is a hormone, and it will go to the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus and tells you that you are full, and so you will stop eating. Remember, we are a homeostatic animal. We are a homeostatic machine. We tend to maintain balance. On the other way around, if you lack energy in the adipose tissue, your other organs have sensors and it will detect it, and it, especially the stomach. It will make ghrelin, PYY from the stomach, GLP-1, and it will tell the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus that you are hungry, there's no energy, so you will tend to eat more to load up with gas, like putting up gasoline. This is in a nutshell. So let's talk about the mitochondria. I hope you don't mind me talking a little bit more on biochemistry in the next few slides, but I'm going to make it as simple as I can. So let's magnify. In the mitochondrial membrane, you will see different machines. Let's simplify. It's, it's composed of different complexes from C1, C2, all the way to C5. And they're like an engine of a car. They are divided into a transmission and a motor. And these two are coupled. When they are coupled, they work to produce energy, like a transmission of a car. The car has a transmission that is coupled with the gear, the motor. It will make the wheels move and produce energy of motion. So let's get back to the machine. When you eat food in the form of carbohydrates and fat, it enters the mitochondria and your mitochondria extracts electrons. Be mindful that the mitochondria doesn't care what you eat as long as it can extract electrons from it, from which it will make ATP. I will show you. Glucose and fat comes in, electron is extracted, it bounces from one complex to the next. In that process, as it passes through each complex, it will pump protons from the inner space to the outer space. As it keeps on doing that, it will do the pumping of the protons. There will be a buildup of protons in the inner space or the lower space. So there is more of it here. It will cascade down this motor, rotate that motor, and make ATP. That's how it works in a nutshell. This is what it looks like in real life. These are the different complexes. The locked electrons are being transferred from one complex to the next. Does that sound familiar? Movement of electrons? It sounds like electricity, right? Correct. Because the movement of electron is electricity. In fact, they measured the voltage in, in the mitochondria. It is about 150 millivolts. So this is the motor that I was talking about. It rotates and it moves about 150 revolutions per minute making ATP equivalent to your body weight per day. So if you're 200 pounds, you're making 200 pounds of ATP a day. Isn't it amazing that we are made of nanomotors and nanopumps, and we are powered by carbon and electricity, so we're, we're a hybrid. So 
The secret in, in losing fat from adipose cells is to uncouple that engine so that the motor will not turn and, and stop production of ATP and so that you would lose fat, fat mass. So let's go back to the engine. This time, you, you ate too much. So you will notice that there's a lot of electrons in the complexes because you extracted a lot of electrons from the numerous amounts of food that you've eaten. We'll show it here. There's a lot of glucose coming in. There's more electrons, but it will still do its job. Electrons will still transfer from one complex to the next. In the process, pumping protons from the inner to the outer. Electrons will keep on jumping all the way from one complex to the next, building up the, the proton gradient out here compared to the lower part. It will keep on doing that job to make ATP. However, there will be a time that the complexes will overload with el electrons. It cannot take it anymore. So it will spit the electrons back and produce free radicals. And free radicals will, like superoxide oxygen, it will uh, migrate from the mitochondria to the cytoplasm. I will talk about the superoxide later on. That's one of the free radicals. How do we apply this clinically? FYI, metformin stops this complex. Therefore, you stop the formation of free radicals, especially superoxide of oxygen. If you don't produce superoxide of oxygen, there is no superoxide migrating to the cytoplasm. Uric acid. I'm mentioning this because this is a big contributor to obesity, and I will allude to this later. Uric acid has a good and a bad side. It's a double-edged sword. The good side, it's, it is an antioxidant. So it prevents more free radicals, and it blocks the bouncing of electrons back. There is a bad side, and I will talk about that later. On a side note, statins block um, indirectly coenzyme Q. So you will notice that there are different substances that work by blocking the complexes. There are more different other substances that block the complexes. But be mindful that the closer to the motor you block, the more deadly the substance is. So metformin, uric acid, and statins are not that deadly because they don't block C4. You block C4, you're in trouble. So what substance blocks it? Cyanide. When you eat cyanide, you're dead right away because there is no production of ATP and there is no compensatory mechanism. And look at this as, uh, as you lose the proton gradient and there is no ATP, the cell will detect this. There is no ATP and the cell will say, hey, we have no energy. Let's make more mitochondria, right? So that is a part of the homeostatic mechanism to maintain balance. So the superoxide oxygen, in this case in the fat cell, it migrates from the mitochondria to the cytoplasm of the cell. It attaches to the insulin receptor, inhibits it, so insulin can attach it. And the GLUT4 is shut down and glucose can come in. Ladies and gentlemen, the pathophysiology of insulin resistance. However, the, the, the First, insulin resistance is local in nature. In other words, it is protective, protective mechanisms. Uh, remember, we always maintain homeostasis. So when the cell is overloaded with energy, it shuts everything down so that no nutrients will come in, in, in a way to protect the mitochondria. It will give it a time for the mitochondria to burn everything in it to metabolize all the food nutrients coming in through the electrons and it will give the chance for the cell to rest and breathe. Therefore, if this is the adipose tissue, the adipose tissue will shrink, maintaining homeostasis. However, when insulin resistance becomes chronic and you keep on doing this, you will end up with disease. So let's start with simple carbohydrates. When you eat simple carbohydrates, like sugars, you, you see this a lot in um, ultra-processed foods. It will go to the electron transport chain with no problem, like a well-oiled machine. It will not do reverse electrons. 
and it will make ATP along the way. The same thing with omega-3, omega-6 fatty acid, which are mostly found in vegetable oil. These are seed oils and industrial oils that we use for, for, for cooking. So this is made of a lot of chain of a long chain of, of carbons with a lot of double bonds. So because of that double bond, this omega-6 fatty acid, which is vegetable oil, acts like sugar. In other words, they go to the electron transport chain smoothly, like a well-oiled machine, without, without reverse electrons, no electrons uh, bouncing back. There's no overload. It will just go straight and make ATP. So if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, let's say in uh, the adipose tissues, right? You eat a lot of carbohydrates, and uh, together with fatty uh, omega-6 fatty acids, vegetable oil, it will, it will increase your ETC and make more ATP. There's more energy. And if you have more energy than you burn, than you use, your fat cell will hypertrophy, hence you have obesity. Okay? So, be mindful again that there is always homeostasis. Our body always wants to balance itself and protect itself. So what happens next? Here comes GLP-1 and leptin to the rescue. From your fat cell itself, because it's gotten fat, it will produce leptin, and together with your intestines will make GLP-1. GLP-1 and leptin will stop your appetite, and you don't eat, and then you will lose weight. You maintain homeostasis. What I, my message here is that our weight is stable. You neither gain or, or lose weight. In nature, we're stable. So what happens though, if you eat a lot of these simple carbohydrates, be mindful that these simple carbohydrates mixed with vegetable oils is very non-satiating. So you tend to eat a lot, so your body in its effort to maintain homeostasis will produce more insulin and more leptin, right? Then, pathologically, it will produce pathologic insulin resistance and leptin resistance, causing obesity, which is a chronic disease. You already destroyed the homeostasis, and your weight set point goes up. So, what does that sound like? So, you mix carbohydrates, especially starch, together with, you cook it in vegetable oil. What does it look like? It looks like french fries, right? Starch, vegetable oil, and added salt. So I'll talk about salt in a minute. So as you gain fat hypertrophy, it will start in the subcutaneous area and then into the visceral organs, especially in the liver, causing fatty liver. There is a topic fat formation, and that is when you get disease and mortality and you get in trouble. We all have our own personal fat threshold, actually. So let's do let's do saturated fat. Saturated fat is also a, a fat with 16 to 18 carbons. However, they don't have double bonds, so they don't act like sugar. Like what I mentioned earlier, saturated fat easily saturates your electron transport chain. So if you eat a lot of saturated fat, it will shut down the electron transport chain and there will be decrease in ATP, right? Okay, so what would, you, what would your body do? Remember, we try to keep homeostasis. Your body detects a low ATP. Your cells detect that, and so it will tell your other cells and your cell itself, hey, we're low in energy. Let's make more mitochondria. So at first, you only have, let's say, one, and you will make more mitochondria. You efficiently burn. So you efficiently um, metabolize and use up the energy. There's a lot of ATP produced, yes, but there are just a lot of mitochondria, so they're efficient now, and then you lose weight, and hence you maintain homeostasis. Okay, well, let's do a chronic intake of saturated fat. You eat a lot of that, and let's uh, do an imbalance of the homeostasis pattern. You eat a lot of saturated fat, chronically pure saturated fat. So you develop pathologic insulin resistance. So you override the electron, reverse electron transport. You make more ATP now. There's a lot of energy. And if you have a lot of energy, more than you burn, you get obese. 
and uh, the homeostatic system will, tr will, will, will be over, overridden and there will be insulin resistance and leptin resistance. And hence, you have metabolic syndrome. A randomized controlled trial actually showed this. The effect of a low carbohydrate diet on energy expenditure during maintenance of weight, of weight loss. Um, this was a 2018 study. You would see here, um, this is a 20 week study in subjects where they gave a low carbohydrate, high fat, mostly saturated fat, their energy expenditures went up compared to the low fat and the high carbohydrate diets. Their energy expenditures went down. This is a 20 week study. So, like I mentioned, in physiologic conditions, we maintain homeostasis, we, we maintain a certain weight threshold. So we neither lose weight or gain weight. When you're coupled, you make more fat. When you're uncoupled, you burn more fat and they're always in balance. No matter how much you trip that scale, it will always try to correct itself and remain maintain balance, homeostasis. Okay, so insulin resistance that I was telling to you earlier with this uh, the cartoon is a defense mechanism of the cells from overnutrition insulin resistance especially the physiologic local one serves as a protective response to intracellular metabolic stress caused by overfeeding and caloric intoxication so when you override insulin resistance in the case of diabetes type 2 or or um, metabolic syndrome by when you add more insulin or you secrete more insulin, it will exacerbate the intracellular stress and increase nutrient delivery to an already stressed cell. So it will stress a cell, it can die. So the, like I mentioned earlier, there are two ways to uncouple. Let's do the safer way of uncoupling. Remember, the secret in losing fat mass is to uncouple it. So when you uncouple, say same thing, same, same scenario, you eat a lot and you're overloaded. However, this time there will be no electron transport reverse. There will be pores that will form in the membrane like wormholes. So it will leak protons from the outer layer to the inner layer without the production of free radicals. And since there is decrease in the gradient, there will be no ATP production because the wheel will not turn. When there is no ATP production in its effort to maintain homeostasis, you will, your body, your cells will produce more mitochondria to efficiently make energy and you lose weight. So as the protons leak towards the inside, it produces heat. It's very hot. They say it's 50 degrees Celsius inside when it's uncoupling. 30% of the resting mitochondria is uncoupled at baseline, which, which actually explains our basal metabolic rate. And your metabolic rate increases the more mitochondria you have. So heat is, is produced in the process. That's why we're 37 degrees Celsius. So the more mitochondria you produce, your white cells turns to brown cells, brown fat cells. They are brown because of the brown tinge of the mitochondria. Brown adipocytes have smaller lipid volume, more uncoupling protein, and higher metabolic rate. And they're actually inducible. And brown fat are present in very active tissues like muscles. And babies have a lot of this. That's why they don't shiver in the cold. We call that non-shivering thermogenesis. This is what it looks like in the microscope. Brown and the white fat. Let's go back to the machine. Let's talk about the uncoupling. It's a safer way of doing it. And it's, that's the best way of, of losing fat mass. And coupling protein, what stimulates this? What do we, what do, we do to uh, produce all our uh, uncoupling protein one? Cold exposure, like a cold plunge, jumping in ice cold water with ice, right? Um, they do that in um, the Scandinavian countries, in Russia. Um, heat exposure, saunas, going to the sauna, um, beta adrenergic agents that stimulate UCP like fentanyl. This is how fentanyl works. This is how 
cocaine and amphetamines work. So be mindful that beta blockers block uncoupling protein, so you gain weight. SSRIs and some drugs do the same thing. They inhibit uncoupling proteins. So be careful with the drugs. Exercise, especially high-intensity interval training. Ketones produced from lipolysis, it uncouples. Polyphenols, you find that in green vegetables and colorful vegetables, it promotes uncoupling. Medium-chain triglycerides are medium-chain triglycerides that are easily um, metabolized and burned up, and they easily uh, form uncoupling proteins. Thyroid hormone causes that. That's why if you're hyperthyroid or you overdose on thyroid hormone, you lose weight. Some chemotherapeutic drugs use this mechanism to um, fight cancer to, by producing more mitochondria. Believe it or not, vinegar does this too. Vinegar is actually a, a short, the shortest chain fatty acid. It has two carbons. It is so fast, it goes so fast in the mitochondria that it makes UCP formation and a proton leak. Again, in physiologic condition, our weight loss is equivalent to weight gain. So you don't lose or gain weight, right? You make fat, you burn fat, equal. But, but so why do we get fat then? I thought we're in homeostasis. What makes us more fat than burning fat? What is that switch that disrupts the couple on couple balance? I'll give you a clue. Bears love fruit and honey. Well, grizzly bears change their behavior in the fall. They are hungry, they forage for food, they double their food intake and gain eight to 10 pounds a day. They eat hundreds of, uh, hundreds of pounds of berries and fruits during the fall. So what happens? They gain weight, they gain fat, and become insulin resistant. But they hibernate. And then during hibernation, fat is broken down to provide energy and water. Good for them. However, we don't hibernate. So do you have an idea what this substance is? It's actually fructose. Fructose is especially found in sucrose. And, and fruits. It is metabolized in the caloric pathway to produce energy. Immediate energy is produced in, in some parts. In some, they're stored to make fat and glycogen. However, there is a side reaction. Fructose metabolism require a lot of ATP. The ATP forms AMP right away. So that's a signal. AMP is a switch for the mitochondria to want to make more mitochondria through AMPK. There's more mitogenesis. Isn't that good? Yes, it's good. However, AMPK or AMP produces uric acid. This is the double-edged sword I was talking about. Why? Because, a, it, because uric acid inhibits the switch for mitogenesis. When there is no mitogenesis, you don't have a lot of mitochondria, even in the presence of excess nutrients, your body will think, your cells will think, it is depleted of energy despite the presence of, of uh, abundance. And therefore, it encourages calories to be stored as fat. And since there is less mitochondria being produced, your, your fat cells uh, will, will give off signals to your other organs, especially the stomach, to produce ghrelin as you will end to eat. You will eat more. You will, you will graze for food. And the more you eat, the more calories are stored as fat, and you become obese. And good thing for the, for the bear, they hibernate. However, we don't. So this fructose drives survival response by tricking the animal that is low in energy so that it will gain weight. So in the, um, death, the death of winter, they, they have energy and they can, they can hibernate safely without dying. So uric acid is a double-edged sword. It causes hypertension. It causes um, uh, heart disease, gout, it, hypertension, CKD, strokes, dementia. So you'll notice that the fat switch is the fructose. However, since we don't hibernate, and with our modern technology and industrial technology, we eat a lot of fructose in excess, especially found in ultra-processed foods. So instead of defending us, uh, making us more fat so that we have enough energy to burn in case of famine, um, 
of insulin resistance, which is also the, uh, good. You, you, um, it, it helps with, with homeostasis, uh, physiologic insulin resistance, systemic inflammation, which helps in uh, the, uh, preventing infection. In excess, you produce disease, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, fatty liver, and the like. So what happens? I don't eat fruit, and I don't overeat it like a bear. So how come? We are still obese. There's an explosion of obesity. Why? Because be mindful that glucose is converted to fructose in our body. And guess what? The reaction of glucose to fructose is catalyzed by salt, by increasing osmolality through the effect of vasopressin. So fructose can be produced in the body, and it's called the polio pathway. So fructose makes fat, and we, we obtain a metabolic water from it. So why do deers like to salt lake in the summer? So that they can produce more fructose and get fat out of it, and that fat will be their source of water during summer months. So the combination of glucose, salt, and bad oils, vegetable oils, what does that look like? An example. The good old French fries, triple whammy. So, like the uh, camel, it, when dehydration is severe in the summer, this animal will burn the fat. That hump on its back is actually a lump of fat. So it will burn it to produce metabolic water so it doesn't have to drink. So, high salt diet causes weight gain. It takes a while, and it studies, they did a, a mice study where uh, compared to control, they added more salt in the in the test in the test the test and the, compared to control, they gain more weight. There's more liver fructose. There's more final weight and visceral fat. And in in humans, um, high salt intake predicts di diabetes in five years. So glucose also drives obesity and metabolic syndrome. We know that, right? So However, like glucose converts to fructose. So they did a study on mice again. This time they, they knocked out the gene uh, that, uh, for, to produce the enzyme that will convert glucose to fructose. So in the knockout mice, there is no formation of fructose. So they only, the glucose remains, but no fructose. So in the knockout mice, they found out since there is less fructose, there is less fatty liver compared to the control. So hydration reverses uh, fructose-induced obesity. The same study where they gave the mice a lot of high fructose corn syrup. In the middle, they gave them water, and there is a decrease in body weight, fat mass, and insulin. So mild dehydration and salty diets is, is an unrecognized risk factor for obesity. And this graph shows that people with obesity are usually dehydrated, and they tend to eat high-salt diets. And we all know that high salt diets predict obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. So, overactivation of the survival pathway by our industrial technology causes disease. This is a survival switch turned bad. Another reason not to like processed foods. So, what do we do now? Upon what we know, Avoid simple carbohydrates, especially high fructose corn syrup. In other words, avoid ultra-processed foods. Avoid salty foods. Avoid processed hydrogenated vegetable oils, the industrial oils, and excess saturated fats mixed with simple carbohydrates. Drink sufficient amounts of water. Eat fiber-rich foods, especially polyphenols and vegetables. Exercise high-intensity interval training. Heat and cold exposure, intermittent fasting, caloric restriction, proper sleep, avoiding stress, meditation. It's very good. So new study, I mean, there is no uh, one diet for everybody, though, right? So they did a study on um, in 80 countries. This was released um, this year with 250,000 uh, subjects, and they, they uh, studied the, the common denominator of the best and the worst food in cardiovascular risk. So the best food that they, uh, they found in the results, 
that equate to good cardiovascular outcomes is this list. It's unprocessed meats, some whole grains, whole fat dairy, legumes, some fruits and vegetables. So let's focus on the least, the least healthy diet. Diets high in carbohydrates, low fat, protein is not that much, about 13.5, lower red meat and poultry, least healthy. What does this sound like? Sounds like the standard American diet, right? It is sad indeed. So obesity is the most undertreated chronic disease, and it is important to be addressed in the primary care setting. This, there's a step process. We discussed the first two, and there is a time that you need to step in with pharmacotherapy, uh, especially for BMI above 30 and BMI above 27 with comorbidity, and you lose weight goal about 20%. And if that you maximize that, it doesn't work. You stop the pharmacotherapy. You can jump to endoscopic procedures, which is not usually done, and you can do, uh, consider bariatric surgery as the last resort. If the BMI is above 40 with, or a BMI of 35, more than 35 with comorbidity, and you could uh, lose weight about 20 to 40 percent total body weight. This is a list, one page of all the medications uh, for obesity, FDA approved and off label non FDA approved <coughs> medications. So, what's our conclusion? <coughs> The American population is sad because the standard American diet, and it's on an SOS, sugars, bad oils, and salt. Thank you very much.